Madam Vice Chair, it is 6 p.m. Uh, we are ready to get started with our, our study session. Thank you. The Clarksville Montgomery County study session is called to order. Mr. House. Yes, ma'am. The, the first item on the, on the agenda is, is a routine surplus property item um, that uh, is, is in reference to 20 school buses um, that uh, will be decommissioned and, and, uh, and scrapped. Uh, so uh, this is, again, like I said, a routine item, um, and, uh, and these buses will not only be re decommissioned, but they will be scrapped. Be glad to answer any questions at this time in reference to item number one. Moving on to item number two, um, Dr. Angela Huff and, and both Sean and Paratrice will, uh, will share in the duties of uh, presenting uh, this particular item. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to both of them at this time. Good evening, board members and Mr. House. This presentation will provide the latest uh, registration information with the Enrollment Center and the K-12 Virtual School. As Mr. House stated, Dr. Imperatrice and I will be presenting this presentation together. So beginning with the Enrollment Center. Let's see. I think Mr. Holman may have taken the presentation down. There we go. All right, beginning with the Enrollment Center, uh, we opened the Enrollment Center on June 10th, 2019, and it was basically open as a centralized location to register students and obtain documentation and resources. Due to COVID-19, the Enrollment Center was closed to the public between March 16th and May 27th, and we reopened the Enrollment Center May 28th by appointment only. Total visitors to the Enrollment Center between May 28th and July 28th were 385, but we also had an additional 519 requests online for records and transcripts, and those were submitted and it brought our total to 904. But out of those 385 families that walked into the Enrollment Center, the reason for their visit was uh, to enroll their student, 294 persons came in for that. Records request was 90, and then one request for the Student Services Department. Since May 1st, there have been 2,819 student records imported into PowerSchool for new enrollments. Of these 2,819, 845 were children that were military-connected families, so about 30%. Largest number of online enrollments by school since May 1st, Rossview with 185, Sango with 168, Oakland with 162, Glen Ellen 138, and West Creek 137. Online pre-enrollments by grade since May 1st, uh, Pre-K, there's been 57 total, and you can see the other grade levels there uh, with pre-enrollment uh, since May 1st. I'd like to talk to you about the K-12 uh, virtual school option. We've had this option for about eight years, but it was about 165 students. So you know, as, as COVID has hit and we developed a reopening plan, we wanted to expand this option for our families. Uh, I've talked to a lot of those families. Um, it's a comprehensive kindergarten through 12th grade virtual instruction program at no cost to families. We believe that uh, Clarksville, Montgomery County um, school teachers and administrators are the best to serve our students. So many of these parents uh, that have contacted us about this virtual option um, many of their families have underlying health conditions and they really haven't been out of the house since about March 12th and they were looking for another option. So that, um, that certainly encouraged us to provide that option for them. So we sent out an online form to each household asking parents and guardians to indicate their preference between traditional and virtual school for their student. And for those parents and guardians who did not have a response, the school's front offices are working on uh, garnering that response right now. And if you look at the data, we've been pretty highly successful on the next slide um, with 
with our percentages of return. So you see about 13,306 virtual students, 36% um, of the students or parents that responded, 52% um, chose traditional. We still have 10% out there that we're working very hard to get. And then we are a community that, that is mobile. So we have about 1% that are not, not returning to CMCSS, but this is very important to us. We want to hold on to our students. We believe we're the best uh, prepared to educate them. So we're working very hard on, on garnering that other 10%. But that's what the data looks like right now. Questions about that virtual school option, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Imperatrice. The next item on the agenda, of course, um, Madam uh, Vice Chair, I'll pass it back over to you for uh, community, excuse me, County Commissioner comments. Thank you. County Commissioners, are there any comments at this time? Board members, do you have comments? I think that uh, your request for the uh, option uh, came, came in real well. When you look at 30, with 36 percent that want to go virt virtual and 52 online, that, that give us the space that I need. I think to actually be able to do a lot more social distancing than our district, and I'm very proud that uh, you guys have uh, been pros at this so far. And I just want to say that I'm I'm also thrilled that you guys have all these options in place, and I know you're ready for whatever happens and. It's probably not a done deal at this point. Anyone else? Um, just wondering, um, I know the governor had made some comments today and I don't know how or if that affects uh, the current plan at, at all. I'll be going through those, Mr. Nelson, in, in just a couple minutes. Okay. Any other school board members? <clears throat> Back to you, Mr. House. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just uh, three items that I wanted to, to mention to the group. Number one, of course, on a weekly basis, we do provide updates uh, to not only you all as a board, but also our community uh, and, um, uh, and students as well. And the most recent update uh, that we provided to our community last, last week on Friday had to do with masks. As you know, at the secondary level in middle schools and, and uh, in high schools, uh, we, uh, we are requiring masks from the bus all the way into the classroom and then allowing students to have the freedom of, uh, of not wearing that mask inside of the classrooms. But if they leave the classrooms, moving to restrooms, uh, transitions to other places in the building, they will have to wear masks K through 12 now across the board, um, every student in the district, actually pre-K uh, through, through 12. So that was the, the most significant uh, update uh, thus far. Uh, being that uh, we did make that update, we knew that there could be the possibility of some of our stakeholders that might wanna change their, uh, their mind in, in reference to going traditional uh, in-person versus uh, uh, versus our virtual K-12 school. Uh, so we have allowed uh, for them to, uh, to make that change up until Friday. Um, so uh, we haven't seen uh, huge variations at all in terms of uh, uh, our stakeholders changing uh, their stance uh, from virtual to, um, um, to traditional or vice versa. Uh, but we did provide that opportunity uh, since we made a modification to the plan. The, the next item that I'd like to mention is something that, that Mr. Nelson um, uh, talked about, and that's the, um, uh, the governor's uh, recommendations. And I, I'd like to re reiterate uh, that both the, the governor and, and the commissioner of education uh, both um, uh, came together uh, along with the health department today and, uh, and made these specific recommendations to uh, to public schools in the state of Tennessee. The first one has to do with, uh, with testing and, and quarantine, 10-day um, sick window, which is uh, the CDC has, has made some changes and updates 
Uh, any test positive uh, for COVID-19 must isolate themselves at home for 10 days uh, from the onset of the symptoms or 10 days from the date their test was done uh, if they never develop symptoms. Uh, fever must be gone and, uh, and they must be uh, feeling better for at least 24 days. This wasn't a major surprise to us. Our health and safety department uh, had been up to speed uh, on this and, uh, and this change is, is really not a change for us. Same thing for the next one, uh, the 14 day quarantine. quarantine. Any, anyone who has been within six feet of, of, of someone uh, who has had COVID-19 uh, for 10 minutes uh, or more must quarantine themselves for 14 days. Uh, that simply means if, if, uh, if there is a positive test and that, that child or teacher was in a classroom um, and uh, was within six feet of individuals in that classroom, then that class would, uh, would need to quarantine for 14 days. If it means that individual was uh, within six feet of, um, of, of 10 people, um, um, the, the contact tracing would start and, uh, and make sure that those individuals would quarantine for, for 14 days. The next item is contact tracing, keeping schools open uh, for in-person instruction depends on the ability to quickly isolate and, and quarantine contacts is, uh, is what the recommendation was here. Uh, if a child is ill, parents should keep them home, uh, which is essentially what we've learned along the way uh, is, is the smartest thing to do. Parents are notified, uh, their child has, to, uh, has been in close contact with someone with COVID-19. Again, going back up one section, uh, there will be a recommendation for a 14 day quarantine. Um, we have a school messaging system, which is what they're referring to, in, referring to in terms of text texting platform that uh, uh, that the state is recommending that we utilize to possibly assist in some of the contact tracing. Uh, on the last page here, in terms of immunizations, um, there's no change. the The state's expectation is for students to to move forward and get their, uh, get their um, immunizations regardless of whether they're going traditional or virtual. Um, they feel it's critical that children receive their regular checkups and immunizations up to date in a timely manner. In a timely manner. Uh, immunizations uh, mitigate outbreaks and uh, pre preventable diseases uh, such as measles and whooping cough. The last thing that I'll mention uh, in reference to um, the Department of Education and the Governor and Health Department's update is, uh, is the issuance of exec Executive Order, Order 55 to allow contact sports to resume. Uh, they, uh, they will follow the TSAA uh, guidelines. Non-TSAA schools must follow the um, uh, equivalent guidelines and, uh, and non-school sponsored athletics should follow the Tennessee Pledge guidelines. So what this means is um, those that were waiting like football, um, uh, volleyball, and any other contact sports, the governor is putting them back on course uh, to move forward. Um, this, this one was a, a bit surprising because of course our, our athletes have not been um, um, training. As, and and as, a, as a former athlete uh, that, that played NCAA basketball, I, I do know that uh, the proper conditioning is extremely important, uh, especially uh, when we talk about football and, and, the, and the elements of heat that many of them will play in. Uh, so they haven't had the, the opportunity to do that. And we were actually hoping that the season would be pushed back two weeks so that, uh, so that players would have the opportunity to, uh, to move forward and condition in, uh, in a proper way to ensure that they're safe. Um, but nevertheless, the, uh, this executive order uh, pushes, uh, pushes students and student athletes out there to resume play uh, as normal. The, the last thing that I wanted to share um, is, a, um, is just some additional data. We've, um, uh, we've provided opportunities for our, our teachers to, to really let us know uh, what, you know, what they're thinking uh, in terms of uh, their feelings uh, about coming back to school. We've uh, done our best to ensure that we're listening to our teachers and um, meeting consistently uh, with our teacher organization, uh, both PET uh, as well as CMCEA. And uh, they actually did a survey uh, most recently and provided us with some data. We went ahead and did a survey as well uh, to, um, uh, to all of our employees. 
And, uh, and this particular survey uh, provided us with uh, even more information that, uh, uh, that if I can get it going here, I will share with you. And what it, um, what it says is, and, and we asked a simple question, um, after reviewing the most current CMCSS reopening plan and updates uh, and taking into consideration current precautions and the percentages of students in traditional, which is 60% and virtual, which is about, uh, it's actually about 36% as, as Dr. Imperator shared just a little while ago, uh, please rank uh, how comfortable you feel uh, with students and employees returning to traditional uh, and in-person setting uh, on August the 31st. And you can see the data, uh, about 21% of our employees uh, that, uh, that provided us with information. And you can see about 2,300 employees responded here. 21%, or a little over 21% are very uncomfortable. Uh, a little bit over 27% are, uh, are uncomfortable. Um, a little over 20% of our employees are neutral on the, on the matter. Uh, and about 19, a little over 19% are comfortable uh, with moving, moving forward in person on the 31st. And about uh, a little over almost 11.5% are very comfortable. Um, so this gives us a barometer of how teachers uh, are feeling because it's important. Uh, and again, um, you know, our teachers' concerns are our concerns. And um, we're, we want to do the best job we can. Uh, one thing I can say, and I appreciate the comments that have been made already about uh, our work in, in developing our reopening plan. I'm very proud of the product that we have, uh, we have created. Um, we will uh, stay the course uh, in reference to our plan. Uh, we will take a close look uh, as we get closer to the school year to see how the data is matriculating. Uh, we still do, of course, have three options. We have our traditional option. We have our virtual option uh, for, our, for our parents that want to en enroll in virtual schools. And we also have our, uh, our remote option. Uh, that is definitely still an option that's on the table. Uh, and if it's at it's, it's some um, particular time before reopening, if, if, if something happens in our school system or at a particular school where we feel like we need to uh, close our doors at a particular school because uh, cases of COVID-19 have run rapid or the county has, has run rapid, um, we, we would still uh, execute uh, those options uh, in the plan. Uh, we will continue to take into consideration the, uh, the recommendations uh, that have been uh, provided uh, by the health department, um, the state health department today and the Department of Education as well as the governor. Uh, but uh, we feel very good about where we are in our plan and we'll stay the course in reference to that plan. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions if, uh, I, if anyone has any. Uh, Mr. I, have a question. I have a question, Mr. House. When will the child be, temperature be taken? Will it be taken as they enter the bus or when they get to the school? So we are actually looking at uh, some technology right now. Uh, it's not guaranteed that that technology will, um, that we'll be able to get it before school starts. Uh, but it's, it's technology that would actually take temperatures in mass, uh, which you know, simply means if half of the people uh, in this meeting were walking into a building, there would be a screen in the office. And that screen uh, would actually show uh, the faces of every child that's coming through the door at that time and the temperature right above their head. Um, if they have a temperature that's in the normal category, their head would be in green. If they have a temperature that's elevated a bit, but not above the 100.4 temperature uh, rating, uh, then it would be in yellow. If they are above the 100.4 um, temperature, it would be uh, in red. So ideally, uh, Mr. Garland, we would like to have that technology in place. Uh, it's expensive. Um, it, it has to go out for bid. Um, our safety department, along with our business affairs um, department uh, and our technology department, we're taking a close look at it right now. Um, otherwise, if, if we don't have it in place, we would, uh, we would be taking temperatures uh, once, we, uh, once we got, well, actually, we're, we're moving forward and uh, our reopening plan spells out uh, that self-checks 
uh, should be happening, Mr. Garland, uh, self-checks. Uh, so that is spelled out very clearly in our, in our reopening plan, but still and yet, we would love to have the technology. The county actually introduced us. Uh, Mayor Durd reached out and shared um, that, uh, that they had purchased a couple of these for, uh, for, uh, for the courthouse. And um, so I had a chance to go over and take a look and, um, and we were very impressed with what we saw. So we're, we're, uh, uh, we're working to, to move forward and, and get this technology in place. Do we have a uh, bus aid on every bus or just on special, certain buses? No, we do not have a bus aid on every bus. Uh, bus aids, uh, of course, are on many of our special needs buses. And then we do have some bus aids on our most uh, challenging routes uh, as well. Uh, but um, the, the typical um, bus route uh, in CMCSS does, does not have a bus aid on it. Could COVID money be used to hire additional bus aids to go on every bus? I mean, I'm just asking questions now. I'm sure it could be, uh, but right now we have uh, additional priorities that we're focusing on. Of course, we, we've made uh, a, a big number of our purchases for PPE. Uh, we're also, uh, with the CARES Act money, looking at after school activities as well for students to really mitigate the learning loss that we know that many of our students are struggling with or will struggle with. Um, so we've, we've really tried to focus our efforts. Um, we're talking about additional bodies. Um, to, uh, to, which from a salary standpoint would be very, very uh, expensive. Uh, but, you know, anything can be done, but it's all about prioritizing and that has not been in our priority thus far. I asked the question, Mr. House and the staff, is because if we could catch the child before they get on the bus, we're just focusing on their child. But once they get on the bus, everyone on that bus would be suspect, right? Everyone on the bus uh, will, will have an expectation to, um, uh, to, to move forward. Uh, we do have a requirement. There will be a social distancing practice as best as possible on the buses. Um, a face masks should be worn. And as we know, and what we've seen uh, from the CDC, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics, face masks are, are probably the single most important item in this fight against COVID-19. Uh, so the expectation for every a student as they get on our bus is to have that face mask on. Uh, that is important in, in protecting each other. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nelson? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so I was talking to a couple of parents today and they just had general questions. But one of the questions that came up was uh, those students who are doing virtual learning, will they be able to participate in, in sports? They will. Um, um, students that um, uh, whether whether we're whether we've moved to remote uh, because cases have gotten extremely high at one particular school, three schools. Uh, if a, a child uh, or a parent has opted uh, to enroll in our virtual school, mm -hmm. in all of those situations, students will get to participate uh, athletically uh, and and compete. Okay, and then the second question, if you would. Um, if a household has confirmed cases of COVID, yet the child is not uh, displaying symptoms and comes to school, I mean, is that household required to report to the school system that, yeah, um, we do have cases within our home and will that child be quarantined? So the, the health department um, uh, has, has contracted with contact tracers and the job of those contact tracers is to uh, do just that, Mr. Nelson, uh, contact those individuals that have been exposed. Uh, the health department would, uh, would be in contact with us to let us know. Uh, and their information will be vital uh, in reference to us, uh, again, closing down a particular school. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll go off those cues from the health department. That's very important. Uh, and we've done that uh, thus far. We did that last year. Uh, we, uh, we have a, a strong relationship and, and, uh, and Joey Smith, the, the head of the local Montgomery County Health Department is a part of our communicable disease team as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. House, uh, Charlie here. I, I know we can wear you out with these questions. I know Mr. Johnson, <clears throat> excuse me, in the communication department has had a lot of uh, online information, which has been very good. And a lot of questions have been asked and answered on that line. 
and people are able to ask those questions and I've tried to follow them as, as best I can. And for other board members, if you once you get on that, a lot of the questions that we have, and be a lot that we don't have, are answers to. But it's been very informative, not only to me, but to the uh, parents of the school system. But at the same time, while I've got you here, I'm going to ask a question. I know that we'll be pulling teachers out of the classroom to go to the virtual school. And uh, I guess my question is, once <clears throat> we'll still be, my understanding, maxed in the classroom, and, and, and how do we proper distance those students if we have less teachers going to the virtual school for instructions? So again, we, um, we, the, the expectation is that we'll start the school year off with anywhere between 36 to 40% less students uh, in the school system. Uh, and that in itself will help out quite a bit uh, with the social distancing that we, uh, we, we, we want to focus on, not only on buses, but also in classrooms. Uh, we will have teachers that will be reporting uh, to their schools, uh, even if they are assigned to be on the virtual schools team. Um, uh, so they will still be reporting to schools. Uh, but the, the recommendation uh, from the CDC and the American Pediatrics American Academy of Pediatrics is uh, in, in, in best case scenarios, doing the best we can with social distancing. Um, uh, so there's, there's unfortunately not a guarantee uh, that it can happen, but I tell you what the numbers uh, in reference to where we are uh, with, our, with our virtual school uh, enrollees helps, uh, helps quite a bit. Uh, there are some school systems that are struggling right now where they're, they're only, you know, 10, 15, 20% uh, and have similar enrollments uh, and similar issues in terms of capacity in their buildings that CMCSS has. So um, this will help us out a lot. Uh, will it fix everything? No, uh, it will not. Uh, but uh, we will be practicing uh, in all calls, uh, social distancing. Uh, we also on August the 7th, uh, will be bringing teachers back and, um, and principals have already been back. They, they have been actively engaged in uh, professional learning, specifically around our reopening plan, uh, how to plan for you know, uh, different portions of the building, uh, what their schedules should look like in comparison to where we were um, uh, as we prep for start this time last year. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are going into, uh, into the training and development, which is why we front loaded our, um, our stockpile days at the beginning of the school year. So we would have the proper time to prepare our, our teachers uh, as well as our administrators uh, for a, a potential return. But, but will we have, if we'll have less teachers doing the virtual teaching, will we have still have max classrooms for BEP standards? Got it, got it. And Dr. Imperatrice, that's from a scheduling standpoint, you wanna, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I mean, we had three options, remember, when we began. We had the traditional option that could go remote. We had the hybrid option, and then we had the virtual option. And when we got the American Academy of Pediatrics, they reduced that uh, physical distancing from about six feet to about three feet. When, when, we, had the, when we had the hybrid option, um, the pushback we were getting from not only parents, but, but teachers was around childcare and how do you address the childcare issue? And Charlie, are you speaking, speaking specifically to caseloads, uh, a classroom caseload, 20, 20 kids in a class versus 10 kids in a class? Yeah. On mute. You're on mute, Charlie. If, if you have five first grade teachers and two of them are pulled out for uh, virtual learning or vir virtual teaching, and uh, you say you'd have three, three teachers left, but you would be over the max for BEP or max for giving proper distances. I, I'm sure there's an answer and I might not be answering, asking the right. Yeah, and, and, and I, if I, if I, as, I, uh, as I listened to you talk, I think you were talking about the actual caseloads for each teacher. And uh, 
what I will say is that uh, as we work through, uh, through the human resources of what this looks like, we, we definitely don't want to overload uh, a teacher. If there are concerns with a caseload and being able to um, um, have some kind of social distancing in place, um, you know, we, uh, we, can, we can look at some other possibilities. Uh, but right now, um, we, uh, we will be uh, filling those caseloads uh, much like we would on a normal basis uh, with students and, uh, and trying our, our best to adhere to, uh, to the social distances within those classrooms without um, building above and beyond those caseloads and putting more kids uh, above the BEP expectation. And, and we can't go above BEP, whether it's virtual. Virtual will allow you to go uh, to maximums. And so really virtual allows us to be very efficient in our staffing. So if we had, let's say Kenwood, we had six teacher second graders that needed a teacher, but at um, Burns Darden, we had another 10. And then at Norman Smith, we had another four. Then we could use one teacher from that Northern area to teach all 20 of those kids. So we're gonna staff very efficiently with our virtual so that our physical traditional teachers remain at, at appropriate loads. At or below, yeah. yeah. Any other questions for, uh, uh, from board members at all? Mr. House, will the teachers that are uncomfortable in returning to a traditional classroom, will they be given the option for virtual classrooms? So virtual is not for everybody. Um, yeah. What I can say, we're, we're doing a, um, uh, we're working through human resources uh, for those individuals that have underlying issues, health issues, uh, that can possibly receive the necessary accommodations. Um, for those, and, and this is something that the governor addressed today because he was pushed uh, from the media standpoint. And the question that was asked was the exact question that you just asked, asked uh, Margaret, is whether if, if there was a teacher that was just scared and, um, and did not have underlying health issues, um, would there be a stance uh, that would be expected at the state level for, for local school districts? And the governor made it clear uh, that, um, that, that the stance is, is that teachers uh, would be back into the classrooms, if they didn't have underlying um, health uh, concerns that, uh, that required accommodations, so, of course, that's not the answer that most of us wanted to, to hear, but it is the answer that we got today. Thank you, that's what I was afraid of. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? Thank you, board members. That does conclude uh, my other business. Thank you. Good night. Good night.